This is the spill prevention presentation. The sixth out of 12 training modules in the underground storage tank class A and B operator training program offered by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. This presentation is narrated by retiree Spruce Wheelock. We'll be talking about the new regulations, the spill containments that we have at in underground storage tanks. Some of the bad signs that we keep seeing, and of course, some of the testing that needs to be done and other forms of prevention. October 13th, 2021 is or was the deadline date to have installed for gasoline systems, a vapor recovery spill bucket on the vapor recovery connection. Also, all existing piping and dispenser sumps shall be, have been tested for tightness. And if you have a dispenser without an existing concrete pad, you are required to install a concrete pad to meet the current rules and regulations. If you have a marina, you're not required to have a dispenser pad out on the dock, but you are required to have one on the land, if you, have, if you have a dispenser on the land, you are required to have a concrete dispensing pad. We have spill prevention to protect our citizens, protect our health and welfare of the environment. We're here to prevent contamination. That's the whole point of spill prevention. Nobody wants to be drinking petroleum products in their drinking water, out of their wells, or watch it enter the environment. Spill containment, which is your spill bucket. How many gallons? It's required on all regulated tanks at a minimum of five gallons, hint, hint. Okay, your spill bucket is required to contain a minimum of five gallons when they do a delivery. So if they connect their hose up to the connection here and they spill a little bit from their hose, it's got to maintain five gallons so it does not get out into the environment. That spill bucket also has to be kept liquid free and debris free. Okay, if you got, let's say, five inches of water in there, you go to get a delivery, he cannot contain five gallons because it's already partially full with two gallons of liquid or so. Also, you got to keep your rags out of there because that takes up your five gallons also. The function of the spill bucket is to gather and contain drips and drabs from that delivery. And the object is when they're doing a delivery, we do not want to have any excess that's dripped in here to run out into the environment. Here we have a direct path down into the soil beneath the underground tank pad. And what's required is that this area here, if you have this underground type of spill bucket to be sealed so that if there's any overflow or overfill of your spill bucket, it gets out onto this point here, back then it keeps filling until it gets out onto the concrete pad, not getting out into the environment. Now, all our new regulated uh, tank installations do require a double wall spill bucket or this spill bucket be installed within a sump. But the key picture I want to point out here is some of these people have these, what we call an underground spill bucket. And the original design of this was this flops down and the handle flops closed. So it is locked shut. And the reason they have those was originally designed for if you have a tank that's in a flood, hundred year flood zone, so that if the tanks get flooded, that the spill buckets remains dry and the the water does not get into your underground tank. You need to maintain your spill bucket, like I was talking about. If you've got liquid in your spill bucket, you cannot contain that five gallons. Here's a little hand pump in here in this particular design one with a, with a hose, so you can actually pump it out into a, a bucket to take care of it. Drain valves. Hmm. 
Gasoline, we required that drain valve to be either permanently plugged or replaced, but heating oil, we do not. But just beware, I want to make sure that you know that good old New England, we get a lot of sand and salt in the winter, and of course the wind blows around and gets into your spill bucket. And so that valve, if you open it up and you get little sand and grit in there and you go to close it, it doesn't close and it stays open 24-7, seven days a week, blowing vapors out into the atmosphere. So... You may want to replace that if you have one, if it hasn't been replaced in many years, or you may want to take it out and clean it because most likely it may be plugged up on, on you. Winter. Don't we just love winter? So, careful. Be careful if you're chipping around to get access to anything because in this particular case, they actually chipped right down through the wire and broke the wire, so and then they had to replace the sensor. Types of hand pumps to pump your sumps out, your spill buckets out. This is a, a, a good, safe hand pump to do, use. Whereas, no, XX means no, you do not use your shop vac to suck out your spill bucket. Why? Well, excuse me, you're sucking out product, heating oil, diesel, gasoline, into a motorized with electricity and sparks i've seen these spill but i mean these uh, vacs actually when they've been vacuuming them out when i'm doing an inspection i turn around and all of a sudden i'll hear oh, and i've seen these lids pop up about four or five feet in the air so it's an accident waiting to happen because you've got gasoline gasoline vapors you have an electric motor in there and you have a spark and kahoom. In this picture here, I took the screwdriver and I stuck it right down through the hole through the bottom of the spill bucket that was there. Because in the winter, they had this scenario, ice. So they chipped the ice out with, with some kind of bar of some sort, chipping bar. And what they did is they actually poked a hole right down through the bottom of the spill bucket. So needless to say, well, it's great. The spill bucket never contained any any liquid that I had to pump out and clean. But unfortunately, that that hole goes right down into the dirt. That, and that's why I had this, the screwdriver here showing that it, it, it went right down through, totally right through the bottom of that spill bucket. So any spillage whatsoever would get right into the environment. When I took this picture I, to show a couple of things, one is uh, one way of getting this adapter off or tighten it up for, for inspections. The other is, um, what are we missing here? We're totally missing the majority of this whole spill bucket. All rusted and corroded away. And what they did is they just removed the pieces and left the and left it with the concrete. And if you look here, you can see it's dark and stained on the bottom up to this point here where there was heating oil and they delivered and it filled all the way up to this point. And unfortunately, concrete is porous. So therefore that heating oil, it might've been diesel, leaked out through the concrete out into the environment. So what I'm saying is you need to maintain your spill bucket. If it's rusted through, got a hole in it, etc., just don't remove it. You need to replace it. And one reason that this was all damaged and removed was this is actually at a concrete uh, facility and driving those full concrete trucks over it, the top of it got squashed a little bit, which helped to cause the corrosion and the rust, and they just yanked it out. Double wall spill buckets. Ben and I mentioned earlier that some of the spill buckets or new buckets for new facilities are double walled. So you may have a double wall spill bucket with some form of sensor. In this particular case, I'm looking at this sensor and this little arm here is all the way up to the top. Whereas if it was down here, it'd be empty, but it's saying, oh, I got full of product or water. So that sensor is sensing that there is some failure of that double wall that needs to be investigated. On a monthly basis, you're going to be needing to 
read this sensor, determine if there's any liquid in that double wall space. And I was talking about that sensor, that monitor for that double wall space. In this particular case, here's your sensor with the, the readout and it's an MCO Wheaton and it's got a bed, little red mark in here I see. Well, that's because it's telling you that there has been a release into that double wall space and it's filled up with liquid. And when we looked at the bottom of the spill bucket, we found a crack. So therefore we did have a fairly old spill bucket that leaked into that space. That little red place shows you, it says test, meaning that you have liquid in that interstitial space. It should be looking green and it say, okay, that it is empty and dry. That's what you should be looking for on a monthly basis. If you see any red whatsoever, you know you have a partial problem of liquid in that double wall space that needs to be taken care of. Here's another type of sensor. That actually was the little red arm, but the cover, the cap of it is broken, so that sensor is not even working properly. And then if you look at this one here, it's so dirty, I can't even read it. So you need to maintain it and keep, make sure that it's visible and usable. This is a different type of double wall spill bucket. It's a bigger bucket, and this is your inner bucket here. Now your double wall space is this big space and it does have a, a Vita root leak monitor, electronic leak monitor sensor. But the problem with this sensor is it's over on its side. And with leak monitoring, that sensor, it's a bell sensor, it has to be vertically, it has to be straight up and down because there's a float inside that. And it can't float sideways, it has to float up and down. And it needs to be set on the bottom. Now, on a monthly basis, you can get in and by just removing this plug right here in this space, and you could actually visually look down and look at your sensor and look and make sure there's no liquid in there. But the problem with this type of plug is people don't tend to take them out every month and they tend to rust up. So therefore, you need a contractor out there, get that loosened up, get that removed, and lube that up so that you can make sure to be able to take that plug out every month to inspect that space. Do not modify your fill in your spill bucket. And this guy was so happy that he actually put a, a riser nipple on top of the drop tube and got that fill up out of the spill bucket and then he put this five gallon pail over the top of it to keep the rainwater out. He was so happy about that. But no, do not alter. And I'll tell you a little bit more. Here in this scenario, they altered it and did the same thing because it was right along the edge of this parking lot in the sidewalk right here. And then as the water rained, it run right down the side here and then run into this fill bucket. So what they did is they put a nipple on here, raised the fill up out of it. And again, they used a five gallon spill bucket too. Well, by raising it up like this, you're just asking for the snow plow to hit it, somebody walking down through the parking lot to the, to the sidewalk here, tripping over. Do not do that. Also, this has what they call a drop tube in the middle of it, and it may have an overfill device. In either case, now that drop tube or overfill device is not installed per manufacturer's requirement or the state of New Hampshire requirement, and therefore is not working properly. So do not alter your original design. How can you maintain, I mean, in this particular case, how can you actually get, uh, contain another five gallons when that delivery hitches on his hose onto here and it spills five gallons? Where's it go? It's all going out here into the sidewalk. Well, in this particular case, they decided, well, we'll just fill the, the bucket up for some foam and screw this spill bucket, a second one right on top of it. And they put the nipple on it, put the, the uh, spill bucket right up here, dangling in the air all by itself. So and again, great place for the plow or somebody to trip over it and get knocked over. And you're modifying the inner drop tube. So all those problems, no. Do not alter the uh, design. That spill bucket has failed. You need to dig, 
dig this spill bucket out and replace it properly. Any new installation of sumps, new tanks, etc. So if you're going to replace a piping sump or, or a uh, dispenser sump, when they're done, they need to fill it full of liquid and do a hydrostatic test, one of the two possible tests, and to the top and look for leaks. So that's on a new installation. On your existing facility, when, on to, once a year you have to visually have these sumps inspected. And here we have electrical conduit connection that goes out through the sidewall. And it's a very obvious that there is a rip in the boot. So we knew we have a failed sump. You don't even need to test it. Other things that gives us uh, a view of a failed sump. Here we have lots of staining all the way up the sidewall of the sump to this point. So water had been sitting in for a long period of time before they pumped it out. Well, here you look here, so that's suspicious because it's right at that rubber boot for that electrical that we were just looking at. This happens to be a different sump, but same scenario. That boot was ripped right there. And so the water never got any higher than here and it all was leaking out into the environment. So if your piping that's in here ever leaked, it would just run right out into the environment. Very obvious sign that there was a failed uh, connection here to the sump. And, on, and this one here, actually, you can actually almost, yeah, you can see the rip right there on this particular connection right there. This scenario, uh, we had a call that there was a release at a facility on a weekend. The emergency response went down, responded, and took this picture. What they found was that uh, the, somebody started to do a drive off and it pinched the hose, which put pressure on the meter that blew the meter out in the dispenser, filled the dispenser sump full of liquid, and it ran down through the double wall into the sump here, which is proper. Here's your sensor. It's set into alarm. That's fine. And everything was fine. But this was on a weekend. And the owner shut everything down and said, well, I need to get a contractor in here to pump all the product out. Well, if I call on the weekend, I'm going to have to pay extra. So he waited and waited and waited and called on Monday. But in the meantime, what I want you to look at is here. There is a picture of the conduit pipe here. Now, on Monday, I went out there to do a follow-up inspection and this is what I saw. I saw that the liquid had all dropped down. Now the conduit was exposed, but the real problem is you look at the piping, it's all what we call alligator. In other words, that whole outer skin all crinkled up and wrinkled up. And the reason for that is the outer material of the piping is not designed to withstand product for any length of time. So here it is, it sat over the weekend and now all that happened was, number one, all the outer layer of that piping disintegrated. Number two is, there apparently was a leak in the sump somewhere because the product dropped from this upper uh, depth down to this lower depth. So we have a definite release out into the environment besides the piping failure. And what actually happened here is being that he didn't pump it out, he had to have an engineer design plans con and submit them to the state, get it approved, get a contractor out and replace all the piping the DS to inspect again and get back into business. So it was a very extremely expensive uh, operation just because he waited a few days to get this product pumped out. Plus, he then he had to also do an investigation to find out where'd all this gasoline go that was in here. In this sump location, we have a manway with a older style type of steel sump. 
which both are filled with water on the outside and inside the sump. What water has been doing is running down this pad down into the surrounding area of the sump. The area of dirt had been plugged up so the groundwater and rainwater now had flowed freely into the sump, filling the sump full of water. Not a good situation. Also, this older style type of sump had what they call as a mechanical shutdown system that had a float. Here's the float just floating freely out here by itself, so that has failed. They do have an electronic leak monitoring system, which was an alarm, which is in buried. But what I want to point out here is we need to maintain all our sumps liquid free. There's a facility that's having the same problem as that old one. We had water running down across the, the bank here onto the concrete pad for this heating oil. So what they did is they built up a little concrete horseshoe here. So they would divert all the water that was running down from running across the pad to out, you know, run around on the outside and not down, down to where the sump is. Yes, there is a lid and that's part of the lid that goes over the top of this. But what I want to point out here, please remove the dirt. Every year that these get inspected, remove the dirt that's around the outside of your lid here, because what happens is a lot of that silt and sand run in here and plug that up. There should be some clean pea stone or, or a real coarse stone, stone around it here. And so if it's clean, if you get water that's running down the bank here and runs in here. It'll get into the stone and run out into the dirt and run out around your tank and it won't build up and get into your sump. Here's a spill bucket. They did the same thing. They put a little berm around the outside of it to divert the water so it wouldn't run and fill up the spill bucket. This is a dispenser sump, dispenser pan underneath your dispenser. You take that off once a year and you inspect down under the dispenser into the sump and look for problems such as debris, liquid. In this particular case, there is a bunch of cracks, all right? Whole kinds of cracks. Here's a couple of them. One, two, three, there's more there. There's one right there. Uh, there's one right over here. But there, you need to look for those cracks. Yeah, great, it's all liquid free and dry, but that, why is it? Because it's cracked, so it has a failed sump. You look under that dispenser, and you look, you wanna check all your piping that comes up through and your fittings. Here we have some leakage going on. You see it's all wet. Same with this one. Got some leakage, leakage going on here at the quick disconnect all over this, this poppet valve here, which is your crash valve. Little drips of drabs. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Well, one drop every 10 seconds, eh, 40 gallons a year. Yeah, that's $80 in product. 150 ton cleanup. Uh -oh. Okay, this is from Alaska. Just telling you that a little bit of leakage could mean a huge cleanup and huge expense. So those little drips and drabs need to be taken care of. Tightness test was required for single wall spill buckets since 2017 and to be conducted every three years. Now the, to be exempt from doing that three year tightness test on that spill bucket is if you have a double walled secondary contained spill bucket with a leak monitoring sensor. And that sensor has to be monitored on a monthly basis and written down on your monthly AB operator inspection form. That way you could be exempt from doing the three year test, but you have to have a double wall with that sensor and being checking it every single month. The results of your test are required, of course, to be submitted to us within 30 days. Another little hint I want to talk about here is that the contractor is not required to notify us of these tests. The owner is. 
the only time a contractor is required to notify us of a failed test would be on a tank tightness test. So if he does a tank tightness test, it fails. He's required by the regulation and law to notify you and notify us. And you're also by law required to notify us. But all the other types of, of testing going on and work going on is required to be notified to us by you, not the tester. Now, you may want to include in your contract with your tester to submit this information to us, but it's only required by the rules and regulation of a tightness test failure that the contractor has to notify us. Tightness test of that sump. Again, coming right up here, 2021. If it's not already here, it's gonna be here. And you need to do a tightness test every three years thereafter when you first did it. Of course, the exemption is for your double wall sump with leak monitoring. It has to be inspected on an annual basis. And if you're doing that, you're exempt from doing this containment test. Currently back in 2020 here, I think we've only, I think we only got a, less than a handful of sites that are double wall sumps. So most of you will have to do this tightness test. And again, results have to be submitted to us within the 30 days. The types of tests that you can conduct would be your hydrostatic test, hint, hint, that is with water. The other method is pneumatic test, which is a air test, hint, hint, okay? Pneumatic is an air test, which could be most likely a vacuum test. They have a machine here and they pull a vacuum on your spill bucket or your sump. For a period of time, measure the loss to see if you have a leak. Now, there are other third-party approved testing out there that we will accept. Now, if they're doing a pressure test, which requires equipment, the manufacturer will have to certify the tester so that they know and you know that you're using their equipment properly for doing the testing. And again, you need to submit those results to us to be in full compliance. Other forms of spill prevention. For example, we don't want to see this. Good old Exxon Valdez spill. What a cleanup. That's what we're trying to prevent. There are certain things you can do. One is what's required is that you will have a spill response guideline Here's an example that we do have on our website. Uh, what needs to be posted at your facility? Commonly, I find that this is not posted. Oh, we just did some painting. We took it, took all the paperwork down and we painted. We're trying to clean it, clean it nice and neat. Well, you need to make sure that this gets posted. Otherwise, your inspector is required to write you up. Problems. Well... Here's an example, thankfully it's been repaired, and, well, excuse me, this whole tank pad has been replaced since this situation. But if you look, you've got a tank here, you've got a tank here, you've got your fills here, fills here, and guess what? We have a catch basin drain right here, which has a lot of speedy dry around, so you know you've had a release at one time recently, and they put speedy dry down. Well, that looks like it's all run down into the catch basin. Well, in this particular catch, catch basin, ran the pipe right out through this way, out into a wetlands. Okay, out of sight, out of mind. Well, that wetlands happens to go into a salt marsh, which happens to go into the river, which happens to be affecting all the clam digging, et cetera, et cetera, on the seacoast. So they are polluting uh, our, our food situation. So we're impacting both the environment and also nature and our foods. If you got that type of scenario where you have catch basins like this, 
Here's a uh, training session that was going on for your class a, uh, C operator. And what they had was these, these rubber mats. So if they have a release at a facility at their facility, they th immediately throw these things out to cover up th the drain so that the product would not go down through the drain. Most of these types of mats are designed so that it will stop the flow of product but allow water to go through. So that's a good win-win for protecting the environment. In this particular case, happened to be that same facility where I showed you that that uh, sump there was full of gasoline, and I said that the dispenser had filled up full of, of gasoline, and it ran down through the double wall piping to the sump, and he, he waited two days. Well, when it happened is the uh, the person started to drive off realizing that they forgot to take the nozzle out of their car stop but it stretched the hose enough that it built up that pressure blew the seal out of that that uh, meter in that dispenser it actually kept the pump had kept going and and filled that whole sump up full of liquid of gasoline overflowed and it started running down the parking lot and this is the result of it so they had a bunch of pads and speedy dry and they dumped it down here and lo and behold they stopped inches from getting down into the actual storm drain so it did not have an impact in that respect into the storm drain from what emergency response said so they were very very lucky again here's that same picture we have the um, picture of the conduit exposed and all the piping that disintegrated. If you have a heating system, please check your boiler rooms to see if, that, if you have a floor drain. If you have a floor drain, you please, please reach out to the Drinking Water Groundwater Bureau to see if it's number one registered and also to determine what needs to take place, if anything, because we are trying to protect their drinking water. Please contact them at 271-2858. PLBs, which we call positive limiting barriers. So if you drive into a gas stations nowadays, we have our dispensers with this concrete pad, and you'll find all these grooves around the concrete pad. And the reason for the grooves is that it's to contain a minimum of five gallons. So if that dispenser leaks or that hose leaks and you get gas lean or diesel or heating oil or kerosene spills out on the pad here it comes down to the grooves and it's contained it's got to be hold up at least minimum five gallons and remember i mentioned something about if you did not have a concrete pad come 2021 and if you don't you need to install a concrete pad with these grooves now if you already have a dispensing pad around your dispenser, you are not required to dig it up or put these grooves in. Okay. It's only if you do not have a concrete pad that you're required to put one in. But once they're in, you need to maintain them, of course. Here we have cracks, lots of cracks. Well, if you have a release and it runs down through here, it'll hit a crack and run right down through into the environment. Look at this. We're full of sand or speedy dry or something. Well, if it's full of debris, sand, speedy dry, it's not going to maintain and contain that five gallons. It's going to just run right across. For example, like this, see? Just run right across. Here's the older style concrete pad. That's fine, like I said. They have a pad, even though it doesn't have any grooves, but they've also had a release, as you can see, all the, the spillage here on the pad, unfortunately. That's why we have these, PL, what we call PLBs, on the new concrete, so that we do not have this scenario going on. Here we have a picture of me, ding, ding, showing you that on the dispenser hoses, the nozzles cannot extend beyond this limiting barrier. With the new regulations, the 
nozzle also has to be further back over the top of the concrete pad so it doesn't uh, cause a release. In other words, the reason why I'm showing you here this, this hose is too long is if the guy puts a five gallon pail here or container to fill up his five gallon gasoline or diesel container and he spills it, it's outside the barrier out onto the asphalt and not being maintained or, or contained within the concrete. So this does not pass the uh, requirement. The hose here has to be shortened. Also, there looks to be a saw cut or crack that runs all the way through here that doesn't appear to be sealed. So that's another item that needs to be repaired. For dispensers, you have a breakaway. Okay. These breakaways need to be maintained. They also do have a, a lot of them have a date on it that has to be, say, replaced by. That is not a state requirement, but that may be a requirement by your own personal insurance company, but it is not a state requirement. But those need to be maintained. And what, and what happens in, or with these, or how do they operate, is this scenario. Bingo! Somebody drives off. Again, with that nozzle still in, in their tank, their breakaway breaks, okay? And when it breaks, it seals off the gasoline on this end, and it seals off the gasoline on the other connection of that hose. So it protects the environment from spreading any gasoline. But unfortunately, you've all you lost your hose and your nozzle. Hopefully they return them. Here we have a picture that did not have a breakaway, and what happened is the hose actually broke, so all were connected here still, picked up the nozzle and just hung it back up, and all we're connected with is some of the grounding wires. That's all that's holding the two pieces together. In this particular case, they did not have a breakaway also, and so when the police department got a call and says, you got an emergency, he jumped in his, his car and took off. Well, the nozzle was still in the cruiser. And what it did, without the breakaway, it just pulled the whole dispenser over. Caused a release, as you can see the speedy dry here. So it was an expensive repair because now he needs a new dispenser plus a cleanup of a release. Here we've had a release, so they've thrown down a lot of speedy dry. And unfortunately, what I want to really point out here is they left it. Speedy dry, when you put speedy dry down, and we'll talk about these in a number of different modules, is that you put it down, sweep it in, and then pick it back up. It's going to, you sweep it in, it's only going to absorb something for about 20 minutes. After that, it's not going to absorb anything. So you can pick it up and reuse it again until it's saturated. Also, do not put it down and let anybody walk through it or drive through it. Because look at that. If somebody walks through this and then walks into your facility, what they're going to do is drag on the bottom of their shoes the contamination into your building. And if they drive through it, of course, they're just spreading it across your parking lot and then down the roadway that needs to be cleaned up. So please, speedy dry, you put it down, that form of, of, of um, contamination cleanup, pick it back up. Get involved. You see something broken? Repair it. It needs to be repaired. Got some work going on to your facility? Keep an eye on what's going on. Make sure things do not get damaged. Spill buckets, they hold a minimum of five gallons. You gotta keep them clean. Dispensers and piping sumps, you need to be there in operating condition so they can contain all the leaks or before you have a spill. Now there's lots of tightness testing that we talk about in the underground tanks. So please keep up with your testing. Talk to us about your testing. If we need to help you out with finding somebody to do testing, let us know. On our website, we do have a list of testers. Other forms, hint, hint, 
of prevention, such as we talked about was the PLBs, which is your limited barriers and your breakaway course for that hose, your spill kits. All these things are ways to help prevent a spill. Monthly inspections, like I talked about in our generic overall view that AB operators are required to do monthly inspections. That spill guidelines, make sure that's posted. 